Uh, if you have your Bibles, open to uh, Mark chapter 13. We're talking about our Lord's last week. I have enjoyed this personally. Uh, my study of the Word of God has been really good. And um, to think of the things that Jesus would experience that last week, um, walking on earth, looking around at nature, seeing all those beautiful things that were there, knowing that his mission was about complete, all those times when he said that uh, my hour has not yet come, but this time he said my hour has come. Those last uh, words of teaching to his disciples, the last examples of sharing uh, with them, the last exhortations for them to remember, those were there and uh, it was a good week for him. Hard week, but it was a good week. So let me uh, ask you if you would to uh, stand with us in honor of reading God's Word. Mark chapter 13, verse 1. Then he went out of the temple. One of the disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? It, think about this. This is the, the God of heaven. This is the Son of God who came to be the Son of Man, the author of everything that is good, the only thing that he ever knew, which is that which was beautiful and perfect, and, and no one here knows how beautiful heaven is yet. Amen? And they're bragging on buildings, the temple. Look at these buildings. Look how wonderful they are. Jesus said in verse 2, he answered and said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. He says, you're looking at these things and you're so proud of them. I'm telling you, it's temporary. You think that these things are going to last. They're not going to last. Matter of fact, with time, they're going to age. They're going to look out of date. Understand that. And then they move, verse 3, and he sat on the Mount of Olives. That's a, a hill <clears throat> looking across the valley to the hill that Jerusalem sat upon. And he sat opposite the temple. And Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Jesus answered them, <clears throat> and he began to say, Take heed. That's the King James word. We'll talk about that word in just a moment. Take heed that no one deceives you. I believe what he said to those four, he wanted us to hear today. There is so much that is done in the name of religion today. There's so much confusion that's happening. Do we believe this? Do we believe that? Uh, is this one good? Is this one right? Jesus said that, that uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And today it's being debated. Is that rude that Jesus to say, I am the way? Really, it's, it's saying, is it rude for Jesus to say, I am God, and there are no others? The world would say, yes, we have to be accepting and tolerant of everything and anything that's out there, Jesus said, make sure that you're not deceived. No one deceives you. Take heed. Watch out. Let's go to the Word, to the Lord in prayer. Father, now we do ask in the next few moments, as you spoke to them, speak to us. As you shared truth with them, may the same be shared with us. May we hear it from you from your heart to our heart. And Lord, as we hear truth, your truth, your words, let them speak plainly and clearly and may our ears be open unto you so that you can do a work today, a miracle today, a time of blessing today. Do it in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Fifteen times he said these words, take heed in the Gospels. Fifteen times he wanted us to, to hear something. The word means to see, 
to discern, to have to understanding as you observe it. Don't just see it. Know what he's trying to tell us. Know what the reality is that is there. It means to turn the thoughts or direct the mind to a certain way of thinking, to consider it, to contemplate it. Uh, it, it, it means, well, this is what Thayer's lexicon, lexicon says, to turn the thoughts, direct the mind to a thing, to consider, to contemplate, to look at, to weigh carefully, to examine. There's a warning that he didn't want us to miss. Beware if you miss the warning. We need to hear it. We can, we can miss it if we're not contemplating it. So he goes on to speak about things that are to come. Look what it says in verse 28 there. He says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. Now he's talking about things that are to come and he's sharing with them that, that they're not going to understand everything. They're, they're not going to get that clear sign. But he says, there is some things that you can know. He says, the parable of the fig tree, it says, when its branches become tender and put forth leaves, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when you see these things, when you, when you see that it's tender, when you see the leaves that are budding, you know summer's near. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure those things out. So he says, so you also, when you see these things happening, the things that he's talking about with them, the things of the last time, he says, know that it is near at the door. Now you're on one side of the door and you can't see what's on the outside of the door, but understand that, that when you see these signs that are there for you, know that it is at the door. That means there, it's there. It's there for you, about to knock at the door. He says in verse 30, Surely I say to you, this generation, this generation that sees these things happen, that he talked about in depth. We don't have time to talk about all those things today. But he says, when, when the truths that I share with you, when they're happening, understand that generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. Like they looked at the buildings of the temple and said, look how magnificent. Look, this heaven, this earth, it will come to an end. But my words, my truths, my precepts, my principles, the things that I've shared with you, they will not. They've always been truth. I'm just sharing them with you. They will always be truth. I hope you hear them. He said, but in verse 32, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but the Son, no, excuse me, nor the Son, but only the Father knows. Here's the word again, verse 33. Take heed, observe, look, watch, understand. He said, take heed, and then he hear this word, watch and pray. Watch. And pray, for you do not know what time, or when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country, as Jesus would do after his resurrection, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, that's you and I, and to each his work, which we have a work to do, and commanded the doorkeeper, once again, here's the word, watch, watch therefore, it's the third time we've heard it. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming. It could be today. He says it could be in the evening, at midnight, the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Really, it doesn't matter because when Jesus comes, the time of, uh, on this earth, it, it, it could be anything. When I went to South Korea, I realized they're 12 hours different. So when I was calling my wife at 8 o'clock in the morning, it was 8 o'clock in the evening for her, Right? I, I, I'd already slept. She was about to go to sleep on that same day. I, I was calling her from the next day. Amen? It, it doesn't really matter. He said it's going to be, for, for some, it'll be in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. He said, but understand, lest coming suddenly, that's why we need to watch, when he does come, he finds you sleeping. 
What I say to you, I say to you all, church, here's the word again, watch. Watch. And that last week he's walking around, he's seeing those things. He's seeing friends and he's talking to them. He goes to the temple and he teaches, shares parables. He, he, he's showing his love. These four, uh, James and John and Peter and Andrew, when will these things happen? Let us know. He said, I've got this. But what you need to know is that when you see these things, understand that it's important for you to be busy in the moment. So watch. Watch. That, that, that word is, means to be awake, to be vigilant. Because if you're sleeping, some destructive calamity may come and it may overtake you. So he's not saying, <coughs> hurry. Some of us get in a hurry. But he is saying, watch. Look. Look what's happening. Listen. Listen to what the Word of God is trying to tell us. Be aware. Know. And as you know, believe and trust. Don't stress. Don't be anxious. God's got this. But as you go, go forward watching. As you go, go forward with your eyes wide open. Now, I don't know about you, but when Jesus gives us a warning and says it over and over and over again, I think we need to be aware of it. So we need to have our eyes open today. We need to be watching today. Some say it's end times. Sure does look like it. I don't know if it is or not. I mean, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus went to the cross. Maybe another 2,000. I don't know. By the way, you don't know. The angels in heaven don't know. We just read that. Even Jesus is not worried about the when. What he's worried is that while we're here, we're watching. We're taking care. Jesus was going through some hard things. It tells us in John chapter 13 and in verse 21 that during that time, during this same exact time, it says that Jesus was troubled in spirit. You're going to go through those things too. Literally, he was grieving. You can't get away from that. Uh, remember, I told y'all that you're extremely blessed if you have maybe five people in the world that love you, period. I, I lost one of mine this week. Um, we were at the beach, and um, I don't get on social media much, and but some kind of like Rick at two o'clock in the morning. I mean, wouldn't it be great if God could speak to us when it's convenient for us? Two thirty in the morning, and he wakes you up. Hey, Rick, you might want to check; they might be closed on Tuesday. At least he spoke to you. Amen. Amen. One time. Um, I, I took a group from church, there was about 30 of us, and we were going to the Southern Baptist Convention because it was in Atlanta. So we closed down on Sunday night church, and we were going down there, and we drove up, and the parking lot was empty because it was the next week. <laughs> it does happen, brother. It does happen. And, and we had a good time. We went and ate somewhere where two or three Baptists are gathered together. Fried chicken will be involved. Amen? <laughs> right. And Wednesday morning, I, I, I got on social media and I saw that I had gotten something from Messenger. Y'all know what Messenger is? If you're hooked up to Facebook, it'll hook you to Messenger. And I went over and looked at it real quick and said, Chad Thomas had passed, 48 years old, served on staff with me for seven years. He did uh, evangelism. Uh, he was our evangelism pastor at church. We did upward sports. We saw, I don't know, a couple hundred people come to know the Lord, children, through upward sports. We did flag football. We did basketball. We did soccer. And I knew absolutely nothing about soccer, but Chad me out, had me out there coaching. I was just like, kick it and run. <laughs> I didn't know. But we had fun and kids came to know Jesus. Chad knew everything about me. I knew everything about him. But he... uh 
died this week um, in the middle of the night, about three o'clock in the morning. Um, he had, Lynn and I took him food. We took him a boxes of food and we took it. Lynn cooked a ham. I mean, she didn't cook. She didn't go to get the little bee head. She cooked a ham and homemade macaroni and cheese. Can I get an amen? amen? I mean, she cooked the whole thing and we took it down there. His daughter came. He, had, he adopted three kids, three troubled kids. He adopted all three. And uh, his life the last two years has just been, had been so hard, but he didn't want me to come in the house. So he had his daughter meet me and I took the food to him. And y'all get, y'all understand, if I walked in the door and saw him, I'd have probably taken him to the hospital right then and there. And uh, at the funeral, I'm sorry, my wife tells me I'm not supposed to put my hand in front of my mouth. Um, I talked to his dad and I said, I feel so guilty. I should have, I should have known. I should have. And he said, I feel the same way. His mom feels the same way. We don't know. You grieve. You go through those things. It's natural. Please understand this. Jesus went through those same feelings that week. He saw the pain that people were in. He, he saw the brokenness, how they were chasing things that really didn't matter. And, and he wanted them to understand God's got this, but you need to make sure that you're watching. In, I said in John 3, 21, or 13, 21, it says that Jesus was troubled in spirit. But in a few verses later, when you get to John 14, he said, let not your heart be troubled. We go through things in life, but we, we, we sort them through with the truth of God. So I'm going to share with you a truth here that I hope that you hear. It's in this same context of time. It's in Luke chapter 22. And they're there in the upper room. And it, they had the meal together. Jesus said he looked forward to spending that time together with them, uh, uh, having one more meal with them. Look what it says in verse 15. He said, uh, this is Luke 22, verse 15. He said to them, with fervent desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Can you hear what he's saying? I want to spend time with you. I, I love you. I want to share with you some things. I, I just want to enjoy this fellowship that we have together. My heart's burdened. All these things that are about to happen. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, he says, Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me at the table. Judas Iscariot. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom it has, he has been betrayed. They go on to begin to question themselves in verse 23. Is it me? Is it me? You think they'd know, Right? And then, it, it's ridiculous to me, verse 24, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be the greatest. Did y'all hear that? Did you read that? Jesus, moments earlier, got up from the table, went over, girded his loins, got a towel, got the wash basin, and went around and washed their feet. I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. How humble a thing for the God of eternity to lower himself to serve them in such a demeaning way that a slave would normally do it, to wash their feet. And, and then he says, one of you is going to betray me. And they start say, arguing, really, oh, it's not me. I love him. I, oh, I, I love him more than you. Well, I'm the... I'm the one that loves him most. And it turned into an argument about which of them loved him the most or which one was the greatest. How ridiculous. In that moment, with Jesus, they could even sin then. 
Do you think they needed to watch? Be careful, observe, listen. I, 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 I love y'all church, but listen, if these people who had spent three years with Jesus, three and a half years, if they could be so easily turned in that moment, what does that say about us? Are we vulnerable? Do we need to watch and pray as well? From that moment, he says something amazing. I, I don't know because it doesn't say, but when they have this argument about who's going to be the greatest, I have a feeling Peter <laughs> was probably sticking out his chest. I'm probably more like Peter than any of the 12 disciples. You know, speak first, think later. I knew it, Larry. That's good. I agree with you. I'm that, that's who I am. Look in verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Church, listen. Didn't call him Peter. Normally that was the word that he called him was Peter, which meant the rock, right? He didn't call him the rock. He called him Simon. You know what Simon means? Peter means rock. Simon means listen. So he looked at him and he said, Simon, listen, Simon, Satan, which means the adversary. Do y'all know that you have an adversary? Who wants to steal, kill, and destroy? Who comes to divide and conquer? Who always attacks relationships? Who always wants you to pick apart somebody else because they don't meet your standard? He can find those little gray areas and he can, he can major on the minors. And he can come in, you can be just loving and kind to somebody, and his desire is to put a grenade in between the two and explode it. And he's good at what he does. Your adversary has come to me and has asked for you. Understand that Satan can't do whatever he wants. God is still in control. Amen? Amen? And to get to you, he's going to have to come through the will of God first. And, and God will put boundaries around you. And Satan cannot go around those boundaries. He can only come to you as God, here's the word, allows it. And praise God for Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Aren't you grateful that Romans 8.28 says that if God allows it, God has a plan to better you? Now, you might not like it. Job did not like it. Anybody read the book of Job? Anybody want to trade places with Job? Don't you lie in this church. Of course you don't. Amen? And, and it began with a conversation when God said, have you considered my servant Job? And, and Satan said, because you blessed him. So God allowed Satan, our adversary, to take some of those blessings away from Job. And Job still honored God. So God said it again. Have you considered my servant Job? Well, it, you've taken these other things away. You allowed that to happen, but, but you haven't touched him personally. And God said, okay, I'll let you bring iniquity against him. I'll let you bring hardship against him. Physically, I'll let you come to him personally, but to a point. Even then, God put boundaries around it and said, to a point. The same way he does with us. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us, verse 13, no temptation has come upon you except such as is common to man. 
But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God has looked at those things. He understands. Satan may want to sift you like wheat, but God's only going to let him go to a certain point. Sift you like wheat. This is how they would do that. When they, and that, by the way, they, they understood it in that day. We don't understand it. We don't do it this way so much anymore, except the process is kind of the same. What you would do is you would get the wheat and there would be a threshing. If y'all heard that, say amen. There's a threshing. And, and the threshing comes from uh, what, what you're supposed to do is, is on the wheat, it, it, it has chaff around the grain. So you've got to loosen the chaff up from around the grain so that the seed, which is what the wheat is, the importance of it, can be, you can get to it. So what they would do, come on now, is they would get a flail. Now, I don't understand that, or didn't understand that word the way they did. When I think of flail, y'all ready for this? This is my understanding of flail. Right? You're walking through the house and you step on the Lego. Can I get an amen? Y'all been there? That's what I think of as flail. But a flail was a wooden stick that had a leather attachment to it that was attached to a block of wood. Now, they didn't do it just with a, a block of wood attacked, attached to a, uh, uh, the wooden stick because that would be breaking up the, the, the threshing floor. But it would be a, a stick with this piece of leather attached to this block, and it, they would come around and hit it to hit the wheat to divide up the chaff from the grain. Could you just imagine, if you were not good at that, you'd hit yourself in the head. Right? Oh, he hadn't been doing that long. Look at the bruises on him. So it, that's why we get the flailing around. They would take the flail and they would come and they would beat it. And then the, not only the threshing of it, the winnowing. So what you've got is you've got all this combined together on the floor, the chaff and the grains. And they would take it and, they, and put it like in a shovel type thing and throw it up in the air. And the chaff, so lightweight, it wouldn't take anything but just a small, gentle breeze, and it would blow the chaff away. But the weight of the seed would make it fall down. There needed to be a separating. He says what is going to happen. Now, I know y'all aren't going to like this, but let's just let the truth be the truth. God's going to allow us to be flailed. Because there's some things in our life that need to be broken up so that the truth of God can come to its place. I'm grateful that the grain of wheat doesn't feel it. But we do. Have you ever been flailed on? Simon, listen to me. Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Simon knew what that meant. Jesus was saying, I'm going to allow him to flail you. What he wants to do is to separate you from God. But what Satan means for evil, God means for? Good. Say it good and loud. Good. That's exactly right. So God allows it. You have an adversary. Watch, Simon. Be careful. Take heed, Simon. God doesn't mind the hard shield to be removed from us as long as the seed of life and blessing will remain. So look what it says there. But I have prayed for you. Verse 32. Y'all know that before you woke up this morning, Jesus prayed for you personally, called you by name. 
He knows what you're going through. He knows everything, every thought that you have, everything in your heart. He knows your boundaries. By the way, He knows your weaknesses. He knows where you're vulnerable. Craig, He's prayed for you. He loves you. He wants to bless you. Larry, you might not know what's coming, but He does. So He prays before the flailing. I have prayed for you that your faith, that is what we believe, what we are trusting in, though we don't see it, though we don't understand it, though we don't fully comprehend what God's doing and how He's doing it, by faith we put our trust in Him. He says that your faith should not fail. Your faith will do one of two things. Your faith will decrease, or as you trust and believe and obey, it will increase. What will make your faith decrease? Fear. Control. Questioning God. If you... Lack wisdom, James says, ask of God. He'll give it to you liberally. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to grow close. He wants you to understand that His greatest desire is to bless you for now and forever. So that your faith will not fail. And and then He says, and by the way, and when you have returned to me, Remember the crowing of the rooster? When through fear, Peter denied that he even knew the Lord. I love the fact that the resurrected Lord, when Peter's out there fishing, (laughs) hey, you caught anything? No. Why don't you try it on the other side of the boat? Okay. Praise God for the okay. And did they catch fish? To the point that when he saw the fish coming in, he looked back again and said, that's got to be Jesus. That is Jesus. And he just, he can't wait for the boats. He can't wait for the haul. He just jumps in and swims to shore. Praise God. And Jesus has already got breakfast planned. He provides. But then he said to them, Peter, Do you love me? You know it. He asked him three times. The reason he was trying to say to him is, Peter, it's okay. I know. Feed my sheep. We've got a job to do, church. We can't get sidetracked. Watch. Take heed. Satan wants to divide and conquer. Satan wants to attack you. Satan wants to take you down through temptation to a place that that, that is of pain and hardship. But God has prayed for us as a church. God has prayed for you individually so that when you fail, your faith, your trust, your allegiance, when you have been flailed upon, but you find the promises of God sure and true, At that point in time, you will be enriched by Him. You'll have a wonderful time of worship. You'll have a wonderful time of praise. Your soul will be enriched because you are loved like Jesus loves. You're protected and you're kept. When Chad died this week, I... I went through the grieving process. I wasn't angry with God. I was more angry with myself because I thought, why didn't you just bust down that door and go in and and pick him up and take him to the hospital whether he liked it or not? But I can't do, we can't do that, can we? But then I went through the process and Thursday, I, I, I called my small group. I text my small group. I, I need my small group. By the way, for those of you who are not in one, you need one. Your pastor needs one. And I called them and said, I'm hurting. And Thursday afternoon, it began to lessen a little bit. 
didn't he, Lynn? Lynn was worried about me. And Friday was, we came home. And yesterday, you go through those things. That I told the church, I said, he's supposed to be preaching my funeral. I'm 13 years older than him. I, this don't make sense, you know? But yet, I realized he was in heaven. Absent from the body's present Lord. It did, all that health issues that he had were gone. The blessings of God. I'm going to say the word. I say it to y'all all the time. I'm going to say it again. Forever. Y'all like that word? Forever. Watch. Take heed. Satan wants terrible things to happen. God wants to bless. You know, I got much more to say. <laughs> but I think we just need to take what God's already said and just decide, are we going to be the same when we leave? Or are we going to listen to the admonition of the Lord? It's His words. He's praying for us. He wants to bless you. It doesn't matter that you don't understand. He does. It doesn't matter that you feel tired and weary. He's your strength. If you're tired of being flailed on, nobody got flailed like Jesus. And out of His stripes, I am healed. And you are too. Good is there. Choose it. 